And welcome to Healing X Outreach Radio. I'm your host, Augustin Astacio, and uh, I just want to thank you guys for your support. We are listeners supported radio, and um, I have some good news. We are in the top 40 category on Block Talk Radio in religion, and so um, it's because you guys, you know, you're, you're listening, you're, you're sharing what you're listening to, and um, and I just hope that you are enjoying what you're listening to and, and getting something out of it. You know, that this is, a, this is an outreach to those that are coming out of the cults, those that are in the cults, and uh, totalitarian religions. And so um, we hope that we have been a good service for you as far as providing good information. Um, to, uh, that song I chose specifically was uh, Starfield, and uh, the name of the song is Shipwreck. Thought it was appropriate for today's uh, show. Uh, we have a special guest, Maruka Rofik, and um, if you are on the advertisement, there are three chapters that tell her story, and um, and I think that uh, there's a little statement that she made about her and Carl Wilson being two empty wells, and someone described them as two empty wells, and and I just thought that song also is kind of uh, appropriate, you know, uh, I think that when we come out of the cults, we are kind of shipwrecked. We are uh, we are put in no-win situations, and and I think that we need each other, and we need people of, that have gone through the same experiences uh, to, and only we seem to understand one another, our plights. And so um, even though we may be shipwrecked, I think that sometimes it requires two empty wells or two shipwrecked ships to uh, get back into sailing on that sea. And so um, I want to also share about next week's program because I know we're going to get into the conversation. Uh, next week's program is a 9 o'clock program, and we have our guest is Eric Dement, and he's going to talk about the Urantia book. He's with the Evangelical Ministries to New Religions, which is emnr.org, and affiliated with uh, Paul Cardin's Centers for Apologetics Research. Uh, it's called the Centers.org. And um, the reason why I picked Urantia, and you, you probably don't know about Urantia, and if you're looking at that advertisement, you'll see screens of uh, the uh, Seventh day Adventist Church pop up. You'll see the Urantia book. You'll see Johannes Grieber. And uh, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses particularly have a link to spiritual channeling. And uh, some groups. Uh, actually highlighted spirit channeling more than others. And so uh, I think that the Urantia book has a link somewhat to the Jehovah's Witnesses in the fact that they both uh, highlighted spiritual channeling. And it was a whole book created by spiritual channeling, and Johannes Grieber himself produced the book through spiritual channeling. So um, we're going to see those associations next week. So without further ado... I just want to go ahead. Yeah, all right. I just want to welcome everyone to the show and welcome uh, Marika Rofik. Hello, Marika. You're on the air. Hi, Gus. How are you doing? Thanks. I'm, I'm fine. Uh, thanks for having me and uh, thanks for choosing that uh, beautiful song and uh, for the introduction and uh, the uh, tie in with uh, Two Empty Wells. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I I was reading your story at length this weekend. It was uh, there were some things that really definitely stood out to me, and uh, that statement about you and Carl being two empty wells, I think was, was very very uh, insightful. Um, yeah. Now, uh, I I want for those that haven't read it, you know, the, the advertisement is there, the three links are there. Please read your story, and um, even though we're going to be talking to and did I did I did I pronounce your name right? Marika, right? Maruka. Maruka. Right? Mariu Mariuka. Mariuka. Mari okay. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. So um uh so uh you your your mom was converted to the Job's Windows in an unusual way. And um and in the story I think it it, it spoke of specifically that she actually called them back. And, and, yes. and they, they were kind of surprised by that. Yes, yes. Um, I guess she wasn't uh, really available when they first came by. 
And uh, she did, uh, you know, I was pretty young, of course, when all of this happened. I only know because I heard the story many times uh, growing up. But, uh, yeah, they. Uh, she took the sister's number and then uh, uh, a while later called her back. And uh, she really didn't understand what the big deal was about that because she says, well, I said I, I would. And, uh, and uh so um, that's how, how it started, and she did uh, become a witness first, but uh, my father was baptized uh, shortly shortly thereafter. Um, I yeah, think but he opposed, year, he actually opposed, he opposed yeah. the study for a while, right? And initially. Now, when he was, uh, when he was a young person uh, growing up and, like, going to high school, um, the witnesses used to offer the magazines near his high school, and and he had he had accepted the magazines before, but um, you know I, as far as becoming one or studying with them, he uh, he wasn't for that initially. But um, you know it didn't take uh, long for them to uh, persuade him to uh, to also also follow it. So I believe one of them got baptized in 1971 and the other in 72. So it was pretty pretty close. Um, they, they got baptized within probably a year of each other. I would imagine then, uh, due to the timing of their baptism, that the, nine, the push for 1975 was a big part of that uh, yes. that message that they gave to them. Yes, and and I even uh, recall, although in uh, 75 I was only um, 10. Um, I remember feeling very nervous um, in the fall of 1975, and um, I, I even wrote a song about it. Uh, I used to play the piano, and I, it was to the, the, the melody of Heart and Soul, and it was pretty much about the fact that Armageddon was coming, and and uh, I, I remember I, I used to play that in 1975, and I, and I was very nervous in September and October, and I was only 10. <laughs> but wow. I, I remember being very, very nervous that, you know, something's going to jump off here. And uh, and then I remember it not happening, and I remember certain people that were friends of ours, uh, we didn't see them around too much at the hall anymore. So, um yeah, I, I, um, I'm kind of glad we were around during that time since I guess now um, uh, some people don't believe that that actually occurred that way. But, you know, even as a child, I, I recall that, that that really was how it happened. But, yes, I think that was a part of what convinced them. They They definitely didn't think that I would finish school or... You know, I'm sure they thought we would still be children uh, when when Armageddon came, and uh, and that uh, didn't happen that way. Now, your parents did they come from a religious background? Uh, not not a strongly religious background. Um, I, I guess it was a diverse background. My mother, her mom was a Catholic, and her father, I believe, was um, Baptist. But not, uh, you know, our father really didn't practice much. Her, her mom did go to a uh, Catholic church. But and then on my dad's side, I mean, my his dad was um, um, Muslim, and uh, his mom, I believe, was Lutheran. So, you know, I, there wasn't um, a really strong uh, religious background there. I mean, I think they did go to church um, on occasion as, as children, and they had a respect for um, the Bible, but... Um, I, I wouldn't say they had a very strong religious background, and I, and before my parents became witnesses, I only remember um, attending church on Easter. Um, I, I remember, a co- you know, getting dressed up and going to church for Easter, but I don't recall. You know, we weren't we weren't religious really um, before they became witnesses, and and in fact, I remember. Um, early in our witness years, I, I have a distinct recollection of my mother asking me if I wanted to attend the meeting with her that night. Um, that was back, you know, when my, my father wasn't quite going yet, so we still had a choice. I had a choice between going to the Thursday, it was I think it was the, the school and service meeting, or staying home with my dad and watching Flip Wilson, which was a no-brainer for me, you know. I mean, I I had to stay and watch Flip Wilson. I mean, there was no contest there. So, right. Um. So I, yeah, I I, I do uh, remember that uh, 
Um, you know, we, we just weren't very religious at first. And then suddenly, you know, here we had this whole regiment of things to do. And uh, I, my mother had, um, there was a sister that studied with me, a young, a teenage sister that studied with me in the uh, Paradise Lost to Paradise Regained book. And uh, I was only six or so. And uh, I remember that was all a lot of pretty heavy information and uh, like a lot of the uh, uh, children that uh, grew up around the time period that that book was popular, I remember that picture of uh, Armageddon where there was that giant chasm and, and people falling into it and uh-huh. what appeared to be a little girl holding a doll, you know, falling into it. And I just remember that was kind of uh, disturbing <laughs> for me, to say the least, but um but you know suddenly we had all these meetings and we had um studies and 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 from an early age I was conducting bible studies I I started conducting my first bible study with uh the neighbor children when I was 8 and so you know right away there was all this responsibility and all this um you know like a whole way of life that was uh that was thrust upon us and and pretty much now, all this all this happened were you in the New York area or were you, you No no no. Maybe yeah, Detroit. This, this was in Detroit. I was uh, oh, okay. this was in the Detroit area. I, I only um lived in New York um during the years that I was uh, at Bethel, and that was from uh, 87 to 97. But um prior to that it was always in actually in the city of Detroit. Now, uh, oh yeah, yeah. I noticed uh, the years that you went to Bethel. I don't know if you might have, uh, you might have known this person. Uh, I don't know if you knew James Mitchell. Um, I think I did know him. That name sounds familiar. Yeah, James, James Mitchell. Uh, he, now he served. He, he's also from the Detroit area, but James and, and his wife was Kathy, and. Uh, he went to Bethel during those years, and he served as an elder right here in this area. Okay. Um, I've known him for the last couple of years. We even tried to do a, a BTR thing, I think, called Critical Thinkers. Um, oh. But um, and I, hopefully, I'll get him on in October. But you know, I know he went to Bethel, and he's told me stories about how the brothers would go into clubs on free drink night, or you know, <laughs> and not leave any tips, and <laughs> you know. <laughs> All kinds well, of stuff, you know, from, from Bethel. Yeah, I I didn't, um, unfortunately, well, I guess now I think it's unfortunate, um, especially during my uh, early years there when I was uh, married to Charlie, didn't get too much uh, partying in. Uh, he was uh, pretty uh, pretty much uh, towing the party line. So we did a lot yeah. of studying and field service uh, in our off hours and, uh didn't didn't get to see the city as much until um the years that I was there single and then you know like my later years there I got to do a lot more uh have a lot more fun <laughs> but um wow. I did hear I did hear stories of uh what a lot of other people were doing and of course uh you know Bethel didn't look too highly on all that stuff but uh but yeah you're in New York City so there's just so many th- things going on and there's so so much opportunity to uh get into things. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean I noticed just the environment in amongst New York witnesses and and that's because you know I have family up there and uh it's just uh, I noticed that there are different like if you go into the Spanish community uh of Jehovah's witnesses uh they talk a lot about Jesus and, and and not as much about Jehovah in the Spanish community amongst Jehovah's Witnesses. And it seems like the further you get away from headquarters, the lesser their influence. But also in New York, surprisingly in New York, a lot of New York Witnesses, they love to party. They really do. I, I mean, <laughs> I, I went to my cousin's wedding, and we partied till like 3 in the morning, and then when we left at 3 in the morning, we went and got breakfast. It was wow. like, I mean, it's... I mean, they were, of course, you know, they're Latino. I'm Latino. And, right. uh, but it's just in New York, just people, I guess there's something about the city that it, it still it influences some of the witnesses to be, you know, kind of, I call them WWs instead of JWs, you know, worldly witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> well, worldly witnesses but, uh, are certainly more, a lot more fun than uh, yeah. the uh, diehards, that's for sure. <laughs> 
That's yes, true. I mean, they'll loosen up. They loosen up. I mean, yeah. uh, I remember in my congregation, we had big gatherings, and then the society came down on big gatherings, and that was what's really fun about our congregation. We had, uh, we did a 50s night, where, you know, oh, wow. we were all dressed up like the 50s and and do songs, you know, or, you know, kind of like, uh, when, uh, you know, when you mimic the songs yeah. and whatever or things. Like lip syncing or something. Yeah, and of course, I always did La Bamba, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a crowd pleaser. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I did have um, uh, friends that were in the uh, Parkchester congregation in the Bronx, and so I attended some of their uh, functions and um and there and I I had a lot of fun uh, with them and and it, it seemed like uh, the Latino culture and some of the others were allowed to kind of embrace um, different things that were uh, that were part of their culture. Whereas right. um, I'm not sure if that's so much the case with um, the African American witnesses. You know, I'm not sure, right. <laughs> but um, you know, I, I think that. Um, a lot of the inner city uh, congregations in other places other than New York are pretty strict on the friends about um, the large gatherings and uh, other things. I mean, if you if you did if you do it and it becomes known, you know, you're, you're probably going to get pulled into the back room or somebody's going to make a, a big deal out of it. But I, right. I noticed that too. Now that you mention it in New York, uh, there was a bit of a um, there was a bit more. Um, lax, laxness, which which was <laughs> good for us because, you know, everything could get so arduous and and joyless, you know, in reality. I mean, I know that what we did was supposed to make us the happiest people in the world, but right. the reality of it is, it, it was it could be rather arduous and those uh, gatherings and, and trips and, and these other things were really what made it more palatable. And and, and in the 70s, when uh, even in Detroit, uh, when my parents uh, first joined, I do remember there being more gatherings, there were costume parties, there were sleepovers. Um, wow. We would have watch, watchtower studies where we would sing songs and we would eat. and There was a lot more of that, and it seemed like um, as time went on, they kind of um, clamped down on anything that wasn't just uh, following the script of um, whatever wow. you know we were supposed to do. And, and it did become less it just became more joyless, you know, um, the more they, they kind of um, became that way. And uh, and it's too bad because um, it's not really balanced, you know, and um, especially as young people. Uh, but but it, really regardless of age, you need, um, you need something to make you happy. And really um, doing these, um, uh, just going out in service and attending meetings and, and at conventions and things it's that that's just not going to do it <laughs> and not and not engaging in recreation on the weekends and you know all that if you do or if you really do try to do all the things that they tell you to do it's it's it just uh it's it doesn't it kind of sucks the joy out of life so yeah absolutely yeah. I, I think what it is that they don't get is that if it doesn't come from the heart then it's 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 not going to be joyful, um, and uh, you know. I, yeah, you uh, have to recharge I, I, your batteries, you know, at some point right. in time. Yeah, and it's, I mean, you just have to allow people to live their own lives and allow their conscience to follow them. You can't dictate people's conscience. You can't police people's conscience. Uh, right. I mean, that's. I mean, that's that's pharisaical. It's, it's a pharisaical thing. So you, you can't. Make you have to allow people to be authentic to themselves, you know, to be uh, to freely and to choose freely what they want as they want to as far as just a faith life. Or, and, and, and if it doesn't and, and come from the natural heart, then then what's the problem? It's just uh, uh, pushing people in the direction they will naturally. Anyway. And so it's it's not really. Right, I I agree. Yeah, well, the totalitarian religions is that they're so busy mining other people's matters, you know, that they're not allowing people to actually live their faith 
uh, authentically, and and all and and, and 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 it's 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 slavery. That's what it is. Virtual slavery. Right. Um, yeah. And that, that that I am sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. No. So I want to I'm sorry, um, Gus. I'm I'm having a little distortion. Um, I um, I can't hear you as well right now. Hello. Hello? Okay, we're having a little bit of technical difficulty. Let me just uh, make sure I get uh, Maruka back on. Hold on for a second, everyone. Okay, she's back on. Hello, Maruka? Hi, Gus. I'm yeah, very sorry. sorry. I don't know. So we had some sort of a technical Just problem. Just had a little yeah. technical difficulty there. <laughs> back okay. To uh, cut off from the program. Um, back to uh, yeah. You were talking your... about that oppression, you know. Right. <laughs> and I, I was going to say, had it not been for that uh, oppression, I'd probably still be there, you know. Um, which you know, I mean, I'm not happy that I was oppressed, but. Um, I'm I'm kind of um I'm glad to be out, you know. I'm glad that it got it got so bad that I started to see that that was just was not a way to live, you know. Right, right. Now now uh so as a young person you did become spiritual and and uh so I was asking what was it that made you desire to go serve at the world headquarters? Well, you know, my parents always kind of held that up as a goal. Um I remember um uh one of the first times we we visited Bethel, um, you know, because they would take us because, you know, the society said to, you know, take your family there and, and help your children to develop spiritual goals. And I remember um, this must have been like 74 or 73 maybe. Um, we, we drove to New York in a Suburban and... Um, at the time, I, I remember touring the factory, and um, I remember all six of us were decked out in denim from head to toe. Like, we had these bell-bottom jeans and these denim jackets and hats, and, you know, I, I think about, like, I wonder, I don't know, it wasn't so strict back then with, you know, wearing jeans, but I'm sure on some level somebody was saying, well, who is this family walking around here in these uh, these jean outfits? But, <laughs> but, but. I re- I remember uh, seeing it and thinking, wow, you know, this is the headquarters, and I would love to work here. You know, I know I'm a I'm a, a girl, and you know, this is mostly guys here, but I I would love to work here. So I mean, early on, I probably was ten, and and thought, you know, if I this is where I want to be, and and that was it was always a goal of mine. Um, so. Um, so you you was act, act part of the pride and joy of your congregation at the time then. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I guess you could say that. Uh, growing up, um, I always tried to do whatever it was that the young that young people were supposed to do. Um, so you know, I I auxiliary pioneered in high school. I pioneered out of high school. You know, I just whatever it was that we were supposed to do I tried to do I attended the Bethel meetings you know when I got old enough to attend those uh those meetings at the district conventions but of course they would only ha- hand out applications to brothers so um I mean and I you know I was always on the circuit assembly you know a lot um I had people to tell me when I moved back from New York that we we watched you grow up 
you know, on the circuit assemblies. So, I mean, um, I, I guess, you know, I was like one of those exemplary youths that the other youths didn't particularly care for. But, um, now, you, you so, just shared yeah, something that I, I, I didn't know about. They would only hand out the applications to brothers at the conventions? Back then, I mean, I guess this would have been um, the early the early to mid-'80s. Um, they they weren't, you know, I, I think a little later than that, they started the commuter program so that, um, you know, there were um, sisters that moved closer, moved to the city, and then they commuted. But as far as just a, a regular Bethel application and going in, um, you know, on those terms, they they weren't um, handing those applications out. And, and in fact, actually, um, when I was engaged, um, when I did get engaged to uh, Charlie, um, and I asked my, my circuit overseer for a Bethel application because I was engaged to a Bethelite, he, he didn't want to give me a, a Bethel application either, which was... Um, you know, ended up kind of being a, a funny story because I was very disappointed. I I called the circuit overseer directly because um, my my family was always friends with the circuit overseers, and so I I had his phone number even though we hadn't met him. He was a new circuit overseer, and I think he was a little miffed that I called him <laughs> like mm-hmm. directly, like a sister, and. Um, so I, I think he was a little miffed, but when I when I asked him for the application, and then I said um, he 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 asked me who was my my fiance, and I told him his name, and and he said, well, what does he do? And I I told him, well, he works in construction, and he asked how long had he been there. I said he's been there about a year and a half, and he says, oh, you don't you really don't have any um, chance of getting into Bethel, and uh, if, if you want an application, you should tell him to give give you one. And that was that. And so I was like, oh, my goodness. You know, so mm-hmm. I, I called uh, my fiancé and told him what happened. And I guess he ended up um, speaking with um, someone in the personnel department at Bethel. And wow. long story short, um, we don't know exactly what happened, but we know that Brother Sidlick was involved. And about a week or week and a half or so later, the circuit overseer found me. Um, he was serving a a congregation um, that met in our hall. And he went from car to car um, uh, because we were were leaving uh, to go out in service. He went from car to car looking for me and gave me an application. So we never were able to find out from Brother Sidlick, did he call the circuit overseer directly or what? But he just told us it was handled. So, um, you know, personnel already knew my application was coming before it got there because they had to go through this just to get an application from the circuit overseer, you know. So yeah, they they weren't trying to give um get sisters, you know, they weren't trying to get sisters in there at the time. So I I kind of mm-hmm. felt like it was a privilege to even get there, you know. So and uh and and that just really is just another example of how uh the organization is uh geared towards men and and it slights and it's, what's what's crazy about it is it slights the women that are in you know the congregations and 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 women are the large bulk of people that are members of the organization you know they they're the the workforce the the army the <laughs> the large numbers that really uh are part of the organization uh i right. think women yeah. Women outnumber men in that in the organization. Something like I remember it was like something like twenty two to to one, and yes. um, and it's, and yet they uh, they slight uh, the women in in, in the organization uh, and make them. I get, and and, it's, and I mean with all the emphasis on scriptures about women being humble to the men and and. Uh, <laughs> You know, they emphasize any any chance they get. They emphasize a need to denigrate the women or to make them feel lower. And it's yeah. just another example of where the, the the organization really proves to be quite misogynistic. Uh, and the fact that they prefer uh, men or won't even even look at them. You know, they're like making you have to go through your fiance to get an application to go to Bethlehem, and that's a goal. 
you know, right. a goal of yours, you know, and right. it's just a, right. uh, it, it's, it's just another example. So, um, you and uh, Charlie, uh, you got married while you were at Bethel, or uh, did you get married before you entered into Bethel? Yeah, be- before I entered, you know, I yeah. I entered Bethel because I married Charlie. You know, I mean, yeah. you have to go through the application process, but without oh, having. Um, Marrying into it, I wouldn't have been able to just come in as a single, um, a single sister. And 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 did, uh, and did you have uh, you, you guys were courting at the time while he was serving at Bethel, and I guess. Uh, uh, yeah, it, long distance, you know. Right. Uh, you know, already. I mean, with the witness way of of courting, if you can call it courting. Um, you're already kind of handicapped, and and with it being long distance, even even more so. Although right. um, although I I knew Charlie, um, Charlie was from Detroit, and um, I I knew him because we worked at the same job in Detroit. And uh, actually, I was kind of a secretary at that job, and actually I I physically typed out his uh, his Bethel application. So um, when he applied, so I mean, I knew him, but I can't say that I dated him when he was in Detroit. You know, I didn't date him when he was in Detroit. So, yeah, yeah we did date long distance, and which wasn't, you know, obviously not the not the best way to go about that. But um, now, your, your marriage to Charlie lasted how long at Bethel? Roughly um, around about seven years. Seven I think, years. It, oh, I, think I calculated it was maybe seven years, but that might include up until we were actually divorced. Right. So, um, you know, so it was six and a half to seven years. And you was so at Bethel? It was, for, it was a long time, yeah. And you was at Bethel for how long? How long did you serve at? Ten, ten years. A little ten over years. ten years, yes. Yeah, because uh, cause you went back. Um, yes. Now, I, I, I do want to get into... Uh, uh, and 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 I tell you, it's just amazing how partial and biased uh, they they treated your situation with uh, your first husband. Oh uh, yes. <laughs> what's uh, it's and it's really it's it, it, I mean I was getting upset while I was reading it, and I'm sure that a lot of people when they read it they're gonna get upset. <laughs> uh, <laughs> your husband is not going to have too many friends <laughs> from reading the story. <laughs> your ex, let me see your yeah, ex. Yeah, <laughs> your your far ex, but because uh, yeah. he was a real real creep. Anyway, but um, uh, <laughs> yeah, he, he wasn't wasn't it that didn't go down very well. Yeah, it, yeah. Now now he he had committed adultery while at Bethel. Yes. To one of the other Bethel workers. Yes, one of his workmates. And and, and and I want you to let our audience know how how did how did the the organization this is an organization that will disfellowship you for smoking, but uh, yet uh, this guy commits adultery. Well, actually, two people do, and uh, uh, he gets a slap on the wrist pretty pretty much. Pretty much, yeah. Um, and you know, and and obviously, being a woman, and because they didn't allow me to be in there uh, in the judicial committee when um, he was confessing or when he talked about the state of our marriage, you know, I never real really will know for certain what was said. You know, right. Um, so you know, having said that. Um, you know, I I only know from um, things that perhaps other Bethel elders said, um, and and whatnot. I I can kind of cobble together what was said, but but clearly the situation um, made it look like I had some blame for it. You know, All right. that um, because um, that's kind of the way it looked, and it also looked like. Um, I had um I had been given the option to forgive him like he had asked for my forgiveness perhaps and I said no which which wasn't which never transpired so um 
I I think the fact that he didn't just just the mere fact that he didn't get disfellowshipped blew my mind. Uh, honestly, because I was there when he got the news too um, that he wasn't disfellowshipped, it blew his mind also. <laughs> mm-hmm. So whatever act he, whatever he put on while he was in there, I don't think he thought it was going to be as and you know, that's, that's, successful that's for the, him as in one. That's the thing that, that wasn't was really fair. To. Yeah. Was the oh, fact no. that you you don't you don't know what happened and they separated you both and they didn't right. counsel you both together. Right. They never they never did. And they they only called me in and then asked some specific um questions that apparently they had picked from things that went on during the committee because I mean it it went on over a couple of days. But um I think had he been disfellowshipped I I probably wouldn't have um asked myself a lot of questions about what went on there, but the fact that he didn't really, um, you know, blew my mind for years, you know, because I, I really thought that this was God's organization. Right. And um, I really didn't know that much about, you know, uh, up until then I didn't realize that there were people in the organization doing all kinds of things and not getting disfellowship. They were being privately reproved because nobody really knew what happened. So I never really knew that, oh, yeah, it's possible that a person could commit adultery, their wife forgive them, and they're just reproved, but, like, nobody really knows. I actually bought into the fact that this was God's clean organization and that these things just didn't happen. Um, I, I just didn't know. You know, I grew up in it, and I just wasn't privy to what was really going on. So... So if you think of me from that perspective, too, where I really didn't know that these things happened and people didn't get disfellowship, then I really, knowing that he was an elder, he was a Bethel elder, he did this at Bethel, you know, and, and all of that, and that he wasn't disfellowshipped, I just, um, I couldn't understand it, you know. And um, and I felt bad when they asked me to leave the um the judicial committee meeting that first um the first day of it when we both were sitting there and then the brothers you know were trying to decide should I be there or should I not mm. but I do I do have an an idea that he kind of used the hysterical woman kind of line where this might be too much for me and that you know it'd be better to spare me having to sit through that by you know just letting me not be there you know I mm. I do kind of have this I did kind of get this idea that um, I was portrayed as being pretty emotionally fragile. And, um, you know, this is something that I've kind of cobbled together. So, you know, I, I just, um, had I known exactly what was said, it would have been better. And, and, I, and I knew because um, at Bethel, you know, although, you know, we're, we're not, there's not supposed to be gossip there, I knew that, you know, there were many Bethel elders there that knew exactly what went down. And I said, that doesn't seem fair to me that because they're brothers that they know what was said about my personal life and I can't be privy to it. So that that bothered me. I would try to, um, you know, put it in a box and not think about it. But um, even years later, you know, um, when I was um, still in the organization, I still was grappling with it. It would It would just surface and... And I would I would still grapple with it, and yeah, it I mean, never it you, never made sense to me. When you really think about it, the way the organization handles any judicial matters is really not fair. <laughs> um, if, if you go into and, and if you could just go into the governments and in court cases, they never handle things with one with with the plaintiff separate from, you know, the defendant. They put them both together in one room with many eyewitnesses and so that everything will be done fairly in the public eye because public opinion matters. Right. And this organization, though, handles things so privately, so secretly, um, because there is no doubt an underlying bias. A person could get... Uh, excommunicated or disfellowshipped for just, you know, having some small doctrinal disagreement with the organization, and yet someone can, you know, be a child molester and still be fine in the congregation 
uh, maybe have some privileges stripped, but not be disfellowshipped. And, and and this is what's happening right now. You know, yeah. people that are child molesters, people I know uh, of a case in Florida where the congregation uh, elders were writing to uh, headquarters about a man who had confessed to murdering someone in the congregation. And wow. headquarters advised them, and this was on Free Minds years ago on Randy's website, uh, that they don't have any obligation to turn this man over to the authorities, but they should suggest that he does so. Wow. Now, it, it's murderers and child molesters and adulterers in this case are being protected Yet, if I just say, well, you know, I don't really necessarily believe that Jesus came back invisibly in 1914, off of my head. Oh, yeah, you're gone. You're history. <laughs> you're done. You're history. Right. Well, I, I, I have to say, too, though, you kind of just had to know Charlie. <laughs> yeah. He he was very persuasive and convincing and, and very sincere, you know, like, you just kind of had to know him. He's he's a character. So well, that's, that's you know, if anybody could have, uh, you know, he, he just, you know, he really believed his own, you know. <laughs> so you, you oh, just yeah. kind of had to know him. I mean, I'm not surprised that he was able to pull that off, you know. But uh, but, but it, and, it, and it's all a lot of times it's not what you know, it's who you know. It's it's right. It's, it's what you say. I mean. It's it's how um, I mean there's just so many factors involved and and it's it's just um, and I and I and it, it's funny I mean years after that I said to myself if if this if the role was reversed and don't you know God forbid I'm in the position where I've done this I know I would be disfellowshipped right <laughs> you know and 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 I was <laughs> right so, right so you know I, it, it, because I'm I'm not him you know I'm not I don't have those um, those powers. <laughs> Yes. Right. You're not no. in with the good old boy network. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm not in. So, so you know, it, it's it's it, it's just you know, it's it's it just depends, you know. So he it's, made it's his certainly bones. Now, he he did get put out of Bethel though, right? Oh yes, he did. He did get he did get put yeah. out of Bethel. Did he, he ever return to Bethel? Did... Like to visit, maybe. I oh, mean, okay. I, he, but he, he was never no longer allowed a... to serve. No, 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 no. Yeah. But it, no. but but yet. Um, the female in Bethel that he did commit the adultery with, she stayed in Bethel, right? No, 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 no. They both got um, dismissed from okay. Bethel, and they, okay. they, 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 they did get married, you know. And and he did become yeah. an elder again, you know. But, but, um, but he was not, um, you know. They didn't go back to Bethel though. So yeah, so they handle you guys separately, no doubt. He used his influence in Bethel, the same influence that got you into Bethel, to get him out of this predicament. And, um, you know, because he's good with the good old boys. And uh, <laughs> But th- now there's something else that's interesting that happened that really ticked me off. The so-called faux pas <laughs> of the woman that he committed adultery with her picture was in one of the magazines or one of the literature. Yeah, um right? I, you know I'm sh- yes. I mean I, I the the literature I, you know obviously is printed and and the the pre-production is done months in advance, you know. Right. And uh, you know this this picture, I mean it was like um a, a, an art it wasn't a photograph, it was like um an illustration uh-huh. of her, but you can you know you know it was really obvious that it was her. Um, you know, I'm sure that it was already there, and you know, I mean, it wasn't like they were going to take it out just because of that. You know, probably it would probably cost a lot of money, but um, yeah, it was kind of weird to sit at the Bethel Watch Tar study with her looking at me, me looking at her. <laughs> right. So um, that was just kind of bizarre, you know. Um, but you know that 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 that's. That's what happened. And now, now, since that, and and and, and this comes out much later, and, and so I'm, I just want to lead into it. But since that episode happened, and 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 I think what people re- really need to realize about the witnesses is that when you become a Jehovah's Witness, they keep a paper trail on you, and 
whatever you do, I mean, these guys are kind of like the FBI. Wherever you go, you're monitored. You're monitored where you go, what congregation. If, if, for example, I can't move from, uh, okay, I live right now in Marbury. If I was going, if I was in Marbury, I'd probably be going to this uh, Kingdom Hall up there in La Plata. But if I move to Suitland, I can't move to Suitland without the congregation being informed so that they can send my paperwork to the congregation that is assigned to the area that I'm going to move to. So they keep a track of where you are at all times, the ultimate micromanagers. And so this, um, because of this incident, uh, they really set you up for failure for future marriages that you would have, and we're going to find out how that was done. Um, and and it ticks me completely off how they did this, but uh, it just seems like uh, in the organization that you just can't win, even if you're doing right. And yeah. uh, they put you in a predicament. They put you in, you know, where that no matter what, marriage you would get into if you was to get married into, you know, the organization, uh, again, that you were being set up for failure again and again and again because of something that they had done now. Uh, but before we get into that, I want to get into uh, how you met. Uh, you went back to Bethel after all of this, and and uh, and also your, your ex, you know, really got off clean on alimony. Yeah. You know, even though he he uh, he was upset about you know he had to pay something like seven thousand dollars in alimony, which is really right. nothing, nothing. Right. nothing. Right. It's right. nothing. Uh, and I know guys that are paying alimony and they're paying you know up the union. They have to pay for the rest of their life. You know. Right. Um, so you know that was nothing. He really got off uh, in so many ways uh, for yeah. his for his uh, violation of your marriage terms. Yeah. Um, so then you went back to Bethel, and they greeted you, and it seemed like everything was okay. And uh, you, uh, you, you, you met someone again that that uh, that took an appeal to you. Yes. Um, I uh, worked in the press room, you know, with uh, a lot of brothers. And I really wasn't looking to date at that time. Um, but um, the brothers in the press room, they kind of, I kind of viewed them like my brothers because my brother, my I did have a brother that worked in the press room. Right. So um, my guard was pretty much down with those guys because, you know, we just kind of would play cards and, and kind of hang out, and um, so um, Lewis, um, who, who became my second husband, I, I already knew him, actually. Um, he was a bit younger than me, and I, I really hadn't thought of him, you know, necessarily as, as marriage material or anything, but, um, you know, we did end up, we ended, we did end up um, dating, um, and uh, I think what appealed to me um, was he was, the opposite of Charlie, um, you know, Charlie wanted to get up early and go uh, to the Bethel Library and uh, reference things in uh, Strong's Concordance and Vine's Expository, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Lewis um, wanted to go and uh, go to a concert or go to a restaurant in Manhattan or go to the movies, <laughs> so go skating or, you know, do something else like that. And so um, uh, that that was uh that appealed to me and uh and you know he was a he was a nice guy and uh so uh um and he he had a lot of respect for me in the beginning um for having um for staying there at Bethel through that whole situation you know the brothers in the press room kind of had a bird's eye view of what I went through you know staying there through the divorce and they all were just very supportive and um, just really, really good to me, you know. And so um, he had a lot of respect in the beginning, but unfortunately that got undermined. <laughs> that got undermined by, you know, a um, so-called loving Bethel elder that was looking out for him, you know. Why? So, yeah. Now, so, so, but, uh, so, but eventually you, uh, you'd, uh, you guys did get, 
you got married despite, um, you know, the opposition from that elder. Yes, I, I guess he did, he did plant some things in his mind that you right. know you don't and and I and that was completely I I couldn't believe it I was blindsided by that like pretty much especially you know this uh, this brother suggested that he might want to talk to Charlie you know I think that was the probably the worst thing that um, you know so still in spite of what happened with Charlie he was the source of um, reliable information about me you know, Mm -hmm. over, over anyone else. Let's go back to him and find out, well, what happened there? And uh, if I hadn't already gotten the idea that there was a cloud over me because of what happened with Charlie, I definitely knew it at that point, you know. And Um, what's crazy about it is you were the victim. Well, you were the um, victim and yet they're being (laughs) you as a viewer, the the one who went out and uh, violated your marriage. Yeah. So yeah, that um that was unfair and even though, you know, he didn't listen to the brother and and continued on, as soon as um there was anything, the first inkling that he got that hmm, maybe I shouldn't have done this, then all of that came flooding back and uh and he he just felt like, "Oh, I made a big mistake," you know, yeah. and um and it never it never got better um from there. So, and then hey, you know, I, that you, Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, how long were you married to him? Um, about four years. Four um, years altogether. You, now you, yeah. you you both were you were in Bethel for those four years, or did you already no. both left Bethel? Right. We left Bethel within the first year that we were married. Right. Mm. Yeah. So um, we um, there there was definitely tr- uh, problems in the marriage, and um, um, you know Bethel has its own um, stresses. Um, although I, I, I enjoyed my work a lot, still that uh, that sort of living has its own stress, and um, if right. you have other stresses on top of it, it's just a bit much. And so um, we did, I, we, know, we ended up leaving. I, I I equate Bethel to like being in the military because it's very your schedule it's, is really really it's regimented. regimented. Yeah, yeah. And it's regimented. Not, uh, you're living on top of each other. You know. Right. Um, yeah. There's no privacy. There's just it's uh, right, and it's not it's not conducive to beginning a good marriage. Um, right, it's not. And and uh, when uh, Dick Kelly was writing uh, the story, and we we talked about it, you know, it, it's something. I, I guess I hadn't really until recently thought about the fact that it really is not conducive. <laughs> right, I mean, that's no. it's 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 you know it's pretty clear to me now. But um, when you're um, drinking the Kool-Aid, I, I just really thought that, um, you know, this is the best place to be. This is spiritual paradise. Yeah. But um, now I, I'm, you know, I, I realize that um, some of the issues, um, it, it wasn't just me and the other party. It was also this lifestyle that we had that was just right. um, definitely not conducive to um, a good marriage. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you, um uh, and, and like I said, when you compare it to the military, there's a lot of failed marriages amongst the military because of the lifestyle, and it's not really conducive for raising a family where you're traveling from here to there, everywhere, and then it's it's really hard on a family or even on a couple, you know. Yeah. And um, uh, I'm fortunate. I'm, I'm I'm very fortunate that. Uh, and and I and I find myself as as one of the rare people that have come out of the organization where me and my wife came out as a couple, and oh, nice. have, and have endured. You know, um, we've been married 21 years. We had a Kingdom Hall wedding. Um, wow. And um, and I, I like I said, I'm very fortunate. But uh, but it all boils down to also the fact that the first couple years of marriage, and when I look back on, you know, our marriage. The first couple of years, you really, really start just even with any kind of courtship. When you live together, you're starting to really, really develop a personality together, and and you have to go through a lot of mountains to climb in the first couple of years of your marriage. I mean, you, and there's a lot of independency and selfishness, even. You know, I mean, I. I was selfish, my wife was selfish, and then you start working to, together. But it takes a couple of years to get yeah, out of that when you're young. selfishness. Yeah. Yes, yes. 
And uh, so it, it takes a, a while to uh, to stop thinking as an individual and to start thinking as two people, right. and uh, and and being considerate and being unselfish and and not even thinking about yourself to lose yourself entirely in 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 favor of the other. And so um, it's a lot of growing. I think the first couple of years of marriage and and that kind of environment does not allow that growth to happen. It, 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 it really inhibits. And plus, I just think in the organization, it just handles things uh, uh, just terribly in favor of men and terribly against women. And uh, And so, you know, it really teaches women to be something that they don't have to be. It teaches women that, oh, you're supposed to be humble and subservient to the man. No, no, no. A woman is the the man's equal. It's it's yeah. not, you know, she's, no. Her, what she, well, her opinion matters in all things. And when I first got married, I would do things, you know, financially. You have all kinds of issues financially. You, know, uh, you make decisions for yourself. No, I can't make decisions now. I realize I can't make decisions much year, much later now for myself apart from consulting her. Yeah. And I have to take into consideration her views, and I have to work within that arrangement. And that's an organization which pretty much ignores the views of the woman. A lot of the sisters I know were cleaning jobs that were pioneering, and the guys were, you know, felt like they were the breadwinners so that the sisters can pioneer. And yeah. uh, it creates this unequal uh, I'm over you type of uh, imbalance. It's it's really yeah. pharisaical. When uh, when I left Bethel, um, when Lewis and I left Bethel, I knew that I wanted to work because, um, you know, we're starting out with little or nothing, you know, really. And I said, why should I um, pioneer and he work to get everything? You know, we need a place, right. we need uh, another car, we need so much. I felt like we can do that faster if we both work. And so I did, you know, we he already had a job before we um, left, but then I, I got a job and I was helping out too. And we did get some flack for that, you know, but, you know, I, I felt like, well, why why would I not want to work? You know, we need we need money. We need to do something. So, and, and uh, you know, um, the whole headship uh, submission thing, um, uh, just so you know, I was able to make a really smooth transition from that uh <laughs> From that situation to uh, one that's uh, that's fair and balanced and where I'm right. equal, you know, that was it was always difficult to um, submit, and uh, I always had to. Um, there were certain things that I would read of the society's uh, publications. Um, in fact, there was a chapter in the Choosing the Best Way of Life book called. Um, Oh, I hate that I remember this. It was called Submission to Authority That Is Rewarding. It was one of the it was one of the lar- longest chapters in those um 192 page books. And I'm telling you, it did this like whole scriptural um um thing where it it had you um really um it, it made me do the mental gymnastics necessary to get back in line. <laughs> And I would use it, I would share it with other sisters too, you know, and say, read this and really think about it and think about those scriptures. But if I didn't read that like every six months, you know, there's no way I would have been able to try to uh, to do that. But I, I, I'm I'm very happy to um, not have to worry about that anymore. In fact, my husband calls me the head of the family, but, um, you know, that's still talking kind of witness talk. There is, you know, I don't, I don't, believe in there's a head but um but yeah that's one thing i'm glad to be to be rid of <laughs> yeah I, and i mean when you when you come out into the real world and you hear guys call the woman the boss mm-hmm. <laughs> you know that's my boss <laughs> right right it's it's just totally different and, and it's right. true because you know because that's what a gentleman does and and what the the organization has done is it's fostered um uh, abusive, you know, male behavior instead of gentlemanly mm-hmm. behavior. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, and so the it's basically a bunch of men that really think much of themselves, uh, you know, at headquarters, and have made that uh, that attitude or that condition of thinking uh, all throughout the organization, it, it, and created other men who are conditioned to, you know, really think much of themselves or to think less of women. And, and it's it's no different than the type of stuff that we see in Islam, you know, where women are viewed uh, lower than dogs, according to the Quran. And, um, and, and, and in Islam, they kill dogs. They kill dogs. They, they can perform jihad on dogs. And, and I just, I posted a video uh, I think of last week, where um, there are dogs being killed in the United States by Muslims. Oh, so disturbing. if a woman is viewed as less than a dog, what do you think about that? Um, yeah. That doesn't really say much for women, and they kill dogs. <laughs> That's uh, disturbing. It is. It's very disturbing, and and this is this is the maniacal. Um, elitist type of thinking that permeates uh, religions that are totalitarian in nature that don't allow people to basically to condition people not to think independently and not to think critically and uh, and to just obey and and I think the reason why they do this also with the women is because they know that that uh, when it comes to obedience and subservience, that has to even apply to, definitely it has to go all the way up to them, you know, the, the top right. dogs in Brooklyn. So so they want to fashion everyone in a condition where they will be compliant to obedience. And so they, they start within the family structure. And if families are now applying this type of subservience, then then it'll be real easy for them to be subservient to the boys in Brooklyn. Right. Um, now, now you, um, you, uh, there's no doubt that they had set you up for failure, and 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 you had found out something uh, after your second marriage, winded up in divorce, and and no doubt this guy, uh, what was the name of your your, your second uh, husband? Lewis. 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 Uh, Lewis, the minute he said, I do, no doubt, bought into whatever this elder was pushing. And he bought in, no, no doubt, the, the reason why was, uh, you know, I'm just going to say, they were sending a letter to the, your congregations, uh, a, yeah. a negative letter about you. And basically, it was just a, a letter, uh, let's just call it a gossip letter. That's what it was. Yeah. It was a a gossip letter. You were being set up for failure no matter where you went because they were passing that letter on to whatever congregation you went to. And I I have no doubt that Lewis was probably shown the contents of this letter. Yeah, you're right. He probably was. Uh, and, again, it, it frustrates me that um, I can not know this the stuff for sure, <laughs> but um, I'm I'm pretty sure he was. Um, the brother that spoke with him pretty much said, you know, I'm going to pour you a stiff drink and we're going to talk. So whatever mm-hmm. it was that he was going to tell him was supposed to be pretty heavy, you know. So he probably was, and, and the sad thing is I didn't even know really about the existence of this until just a few years ago, you know. Mm-hmm. So I had no idea, again, being a sister and not being privy to that uh, that sort of thing. Um, I didn't know. So here I'm going from congregation to congregation thinking I'm just introducing myself and that I'm just, you know, that I kind of am in control of my um, persona, how I'm being viewed, not knowing that um, that this is following me around. And um, you know, that that's still disconcerting to me this, to this day, you know. It, it, it's it, what's what's really so sad about it, and what's so troubling about this is that if any church did this, I mean, you know, churches that I've attended, yeah, it, it's unthinkable. It's unthinkable. Uh, first of all, I know churches are not connected enough for that to happen, but uh, 
what business? We're we're talking about basically a letter which was probably, and and I'm saying probably with with uh, a probability of probably like ninety five percent. I'm I'm right about this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was based upon separate meetings that your first husband had with opinions he had about you based upon his own infidelity. Mm -hmm. And they chose his opinion. They put it in a letter, basically, and they submitted it. And he was the guilty party. So they took the confession of a guilty party and what he had to say about you even though he was the one who abandoned the marriage by his right. actions. Right. And that's what's Wrong. really upsetting about it. It's like you never you no matter what, you was doomed to failure because they were uh your first marriage was haunting you. Right. It was, and and it would haunt you no matter where you went. So now from that point I I want to go into how you met Carl and uh, and all I'll say is that you know unusual circumstances happens to us all. Mm-hmm. And and I and I was I, I was you know I read what you had I read the the, the three parts and I just want I wanted to know that you know uh, sometimes things happen and you know we're forced into situations and and we're adults here. I mean one one thing that I, I I've, I've studied I've been studying I've I had a study with two. Um, uh, one is a, a former Jehovah's Witness now, um, and the other one, they were both their sisters, and they were raising Jehovah's Witnesses. And, and when we would talk about these subjects. We talk about sex. We talk about, and and it was like it was funny in the beginning. It was like, wow, this is kind of unusual. And I was like, it's unusual because we're actually acting like adults now. <laughs> Right. You know, it's okay to talk about sex because we're adults. We're actually now being what we were meant to be. We're being grown ups. Right. And what what the what the religion has done is it's fostered seven and a half million people to be children. Right. Very well well stated. It's true. It's true. Um so, I, so I, you, I go ahead. But no, I I just want you to uh, go ahead, you can finish what you were saying, but I, I definitely want you to get into um how you met Carl and um, uh, if people haven't seen his art. He's a super uber talented artist. And some, I went on his webpage. It's fantastic. Um, Thank you. Yes, he just uh, got a, an art fellowship um, a month or so ago. So we're very excited that his uh, his artwork is being recognized. Uh, in particular, his print work. So I'm really proud of him right now. But. Yeah, um, the way that I met uh, Carl, um, I initially met him when I was uh, 18 um, because he worked at the he worked at the same job that I worked at when I was um, when I graduated from high school. Um, Charlie also worked at that job, so <laughs> um, coincidentally, but um, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> I seem to uh, have married people that I worked with. But um, anyway. Um, uh, and so I hadn't seen uh, Carl in in years, probably since uh, when I moved away to go to Bethel when I was 22. So uh, after my uh, divorce with Lewis, I um, ended up moving across town and going to a hall that uh, Carl attended. Um, I, I didn't immediately recognize that he was the person that I used to work with when I was a teenager, but um, I, I, right away I, when I first saw him, I thought, oh, he looks like this guy I used to work with. But it wasn't until months later, I think he was giving a talk one day, and I I don't know, it was something that he said or did, and it just dawned on me. I said, you know, I don't think he just looks like that guy. I think that it, that it is him. And um, and so uh, I told him that after that meeting, I said, "Did you used to work uh, at that alarm company?" And and he said, "Yeah." He says, "Well," and I and I told him that I recognized him, and he said, "Well, you know, who did you?" He couldn't believe that I had just then recognized him, but you know, of course, I was coming out of a divorce and all, so you know, I was kind of in a bit of a fog, but. Um, at any rate, he was the only um, elder at that hall that. Um, I knew, you know, because I, I moved clear across town, and so nobody knew me or my family really uh, in that hall. And he was the only one that it, that I had known before that. And so, um, whenever um, 
I um, needed encouragement um, because at that point in time, uh, after my divorce divorce with Lewis, I, I was, um, you know, I, I would miss meetings sometimes. Um, I would have a hard time, and um, I would request shepherding visits from the elders. And um, I think that the, the first time that I requested it, I asked him to come only because that he was a link to the past because I – I had he at least knew knew of me and knew of my family and I thought as a sister especially being in in a kingdom hall and you're a single sister you know you're kind of a blip on the a very small blip on the radar screen you know as opposed to being married to an elder or being a married sister or whatever and so I thought at least he he kind of knows me so maybe he'll like listen to my issues or whatever so um so anyway that's kind of how he ended up um in the loop. He never was my like book study conductor or anything, but whenever he was when he would shepherd at these shepherding visits with another elder, he would listen and you could tell he was really concerned. And um so anyway, I mean, but that that was just, you know, him being a good elder. Um um eventually later on, um there's always I, there's I, always one good elder. In every congregation. I know. I know. Just one. Goodness, just though. one, though. Yeah, That's only maybe one. if you're lucky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you're lucky, just one. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so you know, I mean, never in a million years would I have thought that we would, you know, at at any point end up being married or anything. But, um, uh, I, I guess what what ended up happening was, um, um, we we kind of connected on a level where, um. He was going through some issues with depression, and so was I. And um, in in kind of discussing that, it, it was um, comforting to um, be able to talk about that in a in a setting that was where I didn't feel like I was being judged. Um, I had um, in in the year in the time period that I was married to Lewis, I had had a couple of suicide attempts and. That was something that I never really spoke about with other witnesses because I I really was worried about how they would view me. Um, But when I kind of, in in speaking with him, I kind of felt like, you know, this might be, he kind of told me his experience, and so then I felt free to tell him mine, and we kind of bonded, you know. And and after that, I guess we had like a um, kind of a, I, I thought I wanted to view it as a platonic relationship, um, and and you know you you were a witness. Um, there's so much repression. Um, there's so much sexual repression. There's so much uh, repression. Period. That um, you know Carl at the time was was married, and um, so and and I never would have seen myself as a person to you know have a yeah, now you, with you, a married you, person. Actually, there's something there. happened to you. You had. Uh, a debilitating breakdown to the point where you yes. couldn't even walk at one point. Yes. Yeah, I, I ended up with an autoimmune illness called polymyositis, and um, th- that was in 2003, which I, I honestly, you know, the doctors, um, when I got it, asked me, are you stressed? And I said no. I think I was kind of used to a pretty high baseline level of stress. But but honestly, around that time, that was when I started to think that I wasn't happy as a witness. I knew that I I really wasn't happy. And I was requesting shepherding visits, and I was telling them. I was being honest. I was saying, I don't want to do this anymore. But nobody really believed me. You know, they just thought, oh, she's depressed. And they didn't really believe me, but I was being really frank. I really didn't want to do that anymore. And right after one of those shepherding visits, I was hospitalized. And I, I um, polymyositis affects your muscles, um, and it, it was debilitating. I mean, I wasn't able to work for for months. And um, so that that kind of was um, a situation too, where I, I needed help and I needed. Um, um, and, and the congregation actually was supportive, the congregation that I went to. Um, and I found out later that Carl had spearheaded that um, um, that effort, too, which was which was good. But this is back, you know, this was back in 2003. But um, this whole bonding that I was talking about, that happened um, much later. That was like in 2005. But um, but anyway, um, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a long story, but um, part three uh, of want- that... Um, I, let me just give pause because we have a caller yeah. who I think they want to uh, 
uh, say okay. something. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Caller, you're on the air. Hello, caller 717. Hey, Gus. Yeah. Hey, this is Sean. I think somehow my phone, somehow, at times it just uh, unmutes itself. I don't know how. I'm, I'm just listening in. Oh, okay, okay. That's fine. All righty. All righty. Yeah, I try to get the callers on if they hit, if they hit press one and, you know. Okay. Uh, okay. But I also want you to tell you the entirety of your story. So I actually extended the program. Oh, um, okay. Because I, <laughs> I want to make sure we get every bit of this. So, um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, and that's the other thing is that um, I think what a lot of people don't realize and the public doesn't know, and if you just Google Jehovah's Witnesses and mental illness, and um, and uh, and I I had uh, manic depression at 16, oh. growing up as a wow. witness, and um, and uh, I was severely depressed. Um, I attempted suicide also wow. when I was a kid. And uh, it's, it's not uncommon amongst the witnesses. Dr. Jerry Bergman did a study, I think it was in the 80s, and it's entitled Jehovah's Witnesses and Mental Illness. And um, uh, surprise, surprise, or no surprise, uh, the rate of mental illness amongst Jehovah's Witnesses is higher uh, than amongst uh, secular society. Uh, so, and, and that's what happens when you have an organization that is oppressive, um, that is just parasitical in every every kind of way, and doesn't uh, and and imposes people from using their own conscience, their own decision making facilities. I mean, how, how difficult is it for my mother, who I know my mother loves me, to shun me, and she's being right. forced to do that because she's being told that that's the right thing to do. But that doesn't negate the fact that she still has those emotions that now she has to repress right. for the rest of her life as long right. as she's doing what they yeah. told her to do. Yeah, I mean, it's there's an, an unimaginable amount of repression on all fronts there. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so I, I was in denial. You know, here I was in this, really in this emotional relationship, and I did kind of on some level realize it, and then I, I was like, oh, we've got it. We can't do this, you know. But um, just in, comp- in in denial that it that it was what it was, you know, yeah. and I and I'm I'm not um, you know I mean I'm not I'm not certainly not not proud of that 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 was how it happened. I understand, mm-hmm. you know, how it happened, and um, you know I, I'm not proud of it, but um, um, you know I, I understand it under the under the circumstances that. Right. Um, you know, kind of how you started the, t- the whole two empty walls situation, and right. um, here w- we could actually relate to each other. And um, and I didn't, I, I didn't know uh, his his marriage had was really bad the, the way many witness marriages are. You know, right. it, it's the rare the rare marriage that you see there that's that's genuinely happy right. um, on on any level of the organization. You know, in right. Bethel or or um, among anyone. So um you know just just like there's situations uh, that uh, set you up for failure marriage wise um you know th- there's just um it, it really is l- like you're you're a child you know you you haven't you don't have these fully developed social skills and 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 even right. skills of of etiquette um um sexually or otherwise where you're you're equipped to handle things in the correct manner you know so um I, have, so, have you read Have you read um, Ray Franz's Crisis of Conscience book? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, it was yeah. one of the first things I read um, when I when I was disfellowshipped. I thought I was going to die at Armageddon. I had yeah. not read any apostate literature at that point, um, but uh, probably it took me a couple of years to finally say, "Let me let me read and see what's out there." And and his book was one of the first um, first things that I read. And it rang true to me. It was really, you know, having been at Bethel and knowing a little bit from people that were there about what happened around that time period, it it was it was very. Bad. I really um, appreciated him putting that in writing and making it available to us. And I mean, really he, he just 
he'd left no stone unturned. And um, I, I remember distinctly where he was talking about in the 1970s where, of course, they were um, they were talking about, you know, they were con- condemning oral sex. And mm-hmm. there was a man who was, I think, a cripple or something, and that was the only means for uh, his wife to give him, you know, the, the pleasure that he needed. Otherwise, he couldn't do it any other kind of way. Um, mm-hmm. And so, and and so they were feeling guilty about this uh, yeah, because that's... of the organization's ruling. Right. And and this is this is the kind of immaturity that we're seeing taking place on dictating people's lives and and call, you know Jesus talked about you know the Pharisees put heavy burdens yokes upon the shoulders of them and heavy yokes yeah. and uh, these guys are I just can't see how they can't read the Bible and not see their reflection in the Pharisees. Because that's what yeah. they do. They put heavy yokes and double standards, hypocrisy. Yes. Now that became painfully obvious, obvious to me in the end. You know, after my going through the various experiences that I went through, one of my issues became um, it's it's co- requiring a lot of me physically, mentally, and emotionally to only be like a half stepping witness. <laughs> you know, right. like, and then I started to think. This is too much, you know. It's it's requiring so much of me, and I'm and and I'm not doing half of what I'm supposed to be doing, and and it's just making me feel bad, you know. If if I'm not feeling well, and then I drag myself to a meeting only to hear I'm not doing A, B, and C, and if I if I don't do these things, you know, I'm not going to have God's approval. That, then I'm I'm thinking, wow, you know, like if I had stayed home, I wouldn't have been feeling quite as guilty now. You know, I'd feel guilty that I stayed home, but now I've got A, B, and C to think about also. You know, right. so right. I just, um, after a while, it became too oppressive. The control right. became too oppressive. Um, the time, you know, it all became too oppressive. And t- the, one of the last years that I was a witness, they were studying the um, – the book about Jesus, the greatest greatest man book, and right. and that was one of the only publications I found some comfort in. You know, if I just read the book and read the scriptures, you know, I felt like this 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 sounds reasonable and rational and comforting. But um, the rest of it, the, the the accompaniment, which was all the other things that were expected to do, um, it was um, it was too much. I didn't feel the refreshment and and the lightness that I, I right. thought that I was supposed to feel. So, you know, again, you know, if they had been doing those things, I'd probably still be there. <laughs> but right. I couldn't take it anymore, you know. It was just too much, especially after I got sick. And, you know, I'm I'm trying to work. I'm trying to – and and, and there, was, there were times when they would see my car at my job, and then they mm-hmm. wouldn't see me at the meeting that night, and, and people would say things to me. And I, and I mm-hmm. was like – Wow, you know, I mean, I have nobody else is going to take care of me if I don't take care of myself, and well, you know, so it, 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 it was some, just crazy oppressive. I got to share something with you. You know, we we lived in an apartment complex, uh, me and my wife and my father-in-law, which was called Witness Village, because there were so <laughs> many witnesses that lived in that apartment complex. <laughs> so, wow! You so they would meet, see what you were up to. <laughs> they knew because your car was parked there because everybody. Everybody was going to the meeting at the same time, coming out of the apartment buildings, and yeah, so you, you can't know, get away with anything. No, because they micromanage, they police everything. Um, yeah. Now, in, in the respects of you know all the other issues, Carl was uh, ahead of you on that. He was he yeah. was leaving for so because of the burdens of what he was seeing as far as the blood policy, child molestation, all the other stuff is what yeah. you know, I guess with him being an elder. He was more privy to and and to you know intuitive in seeing those things and and it was it was it was racking his brain yes he he knew what was going on in our hall. I had no idea, and he didn't tell me you know, like for a long time either, but um he knew that there were a lot of domestic abuse cases going on, i mean like bad domestic abuse. And he mm. knew that these guys were getting slaps on the wrist, and that the the women were being investigated, and they were asking the women, "Well, what are, what did you say that made him choke you? What did he? What did you say that made you made him yeah. do this to you?" 
and uh he couldn't he couldn't deal with it anymore you know it it was um and, and then some of the other things were i guess um when they would uh, tell the elders you know call brooklyn in the in this case or that case but don't tell anybody that you called brooklyn and you know they made them write in the margins of their elders book and that sort of thing you know he was like hmm they're telling us to lie aren't they you know so yeah. that that was kind of getting to him he couldn't um couldn't quite stomach that anymore but you know i was blissfully unaware of um of all of that stuff that was going on um but yeah, he did um he did have uh, more there it was more in principle. Uh, you know, he knew that something wasn't right there. I I more knew that I didn't feel right that the way I was being treated didn't feel right to me, but I couldn't say that the whole kit and caboodle was off, but he kind of felt like, you know, this something is amiss here. This 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 isn't right. So um you know, I've said that I wish that I could have gone out more on uh, principle instead of in the blaze of glory that uh, that I did. But right. I, I hadn't quite I hadn't quite figured it out, and I hadn't gone online and looked at anything or read anything. I was afraid to, you know, because I kind of always had the idea that you know apostates probably have some good points because they don't want us to even listen for a minute. You know, I I thought. If the if the arguments that these ex witnesses were making were poor ones, I think they'd want us to hear them so that we we would right. know. Oh, that's just a bunch of ridiculous rubbish. But they they were so tough on us not to listen to them at all that I had an idea even when I was a teenager that you know, they must be making some fairly good points. But I just knew that you know I didn't want to be you know killed in Armageddon, so I better stay over here. <laughs> I better stay yeah. in this camp. You know. So it was, and, and that, um, yeah, that's the reason why a lot of us, you know, have stayed is it's fear. Fear. It's, fear uh, yeah. If it's not fear of Armageddon, it's fear of loss of communication with our family, with our friends, right. because they effectively cr- created an environment where you, it's a bubble society. So right. all the friendships and relationships you foster are within the organization, so that when you do. If you do have the courage, and it takes courage to do the things that we have done, us who have escaped uh, the witnesses, it takes courage to do that because we know that when we do it, we know we're going to be on our own. Right. There's so much at stake, yeah. Yeah. There's there's such a heavy price to pay, but we're willing to pay it because freedom, liberty, there's there's nothing, uh, you cannot put a price on liberty the liberty to think for yourself, the liberty to be free, the liberty to to be an adult and make your own decisions and not and not have to be told, you know, not have to do what you're being told to do. That right, takes, or don't know. don't have to check with the yeah. elders. Right. Every, every, as artists, you know, um, everything that we do now, it feels so liberated, liberating. Yeah. Um, recently I was asked to um, um, have a part in a, a, um, a local film, and I and I said yes, you know, and and I and I I thought to myself, you know, if I was still a witness, I would have to talk to the elders. I would have to find mm-hmm. out the content. What is this about? Am I going to have to say this or that? And it and it and it's kind of you know, laughable that I would have had to consult to make this personal decision, you know. But yeah, even if something as simple as charity. Yeah. Yeah. Even something oh. as simple as charity. You, yeah. I mean, if you want to go ahead and, and help other people's lives by, you know, volunteering at Red Cross or the food bank, the local food bank or pregnancy center to help, you know, single women who are having babies, all kinds of things, you know. Right. And yet you have to check in with them or, you know, or they're not going to allow you to do something that really right. is a contribution. Terrible. Right, no. that's one thing I enjoy now too is taking um being a, I'm I'm a part of a couple of uh nonprofits and I I I love it. I I feel like I'm making up for lost time, you know, mm. cuz that never felt right to me not being able to help. You know, even even Jesus, even though he knew he only had three and a half years um on earth, he he fed the fed the hungry and he and he healed the sick. You know, yeah. he didn't say, "Well, the end is coming." You know, I all I I only have time to preach to you. You know, I don't I don't have time to 
to help you. I mean, how can you preach to someone who's hungry or who's hurting? Mm-hmm. So right. it never sat well with me, even when I was a witness. So, so yeah, that whole control and, and not letting you do that, um, I'm glad to be free of that. Yeah. I mean, uh, look at what you and Carl do. You're a photographer, right? That's what you do. Yes. And and uh, and Carl's an artist, and and uh, you know the, your gifts. You know, the only way Carl could ever he's neglected his gift all these years. Yeah. So the only way he could ever use his gift is if he was drawing pictures for the magazines or something like that. Right. Um, you know, and and that's the only venue for his gift. I um, I interviewed uh, James Caputo in what was it, in April, and James Caputo was a he was an opera singer. Wow! Yeah, you know, he was an opera singer. He's he's gone all over the world singing, you know, opera, and now he's a, a fitness instructor. I think a personal fitness instructor, but. Um, you know the fact that he got to experience that and to share his gift, you know, yeah. in the world. You know, he yeah, made that would his have mark. Been, yeah, it would have been a, it would have been hor- you know, terrible for him not to have. There, yeah. There's so much untapped potential, you know, among witnesses, and you have to just, and you're just denying all of that, and 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 just being an automaton, you know, and I mean, and that's, the, and that's the only bad. the only ones that really. It's okay for them is because now they're they've made it big and they're putting big contributions in that box. Right, uh, you know, people right. like George then they'll Benson. look the other way. Yeah, yeah. and they, they still are not going to just give this approval, but they're they're going to look the other way and not, right. um, you know, yeah. slight you at least. <laughs> yeah, but you know the the average witness is so proud to say, "Well, Serena Williams yeah. is a Jehovah's Witness." Yeah, right, <laughs> so, right, right. You know. Uh, Oh, when Michael Jackson was a witness, I remember I used to be proud to say Michael Jackson is a Jehovah's Witness. You know, <laughs> I, I just was asked that yesterday. A couple of my uh, workmates just asked. They said, "Do witnesses do they like do they like to tout their celebrities?" Because they said, like in Scientology, they said, "You know, you know all of these names of these celebrities," but they said, um, "We don't we don't know any witch Jehovah's Witness celebrities." And so I, I named some for them, but I said. Um, yeah, they don't. They really don't tout it, you know. They'll 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 kind of look the other way, but right. they, you know, most of those aren't necessarily those folks aren't necessarily considered exemplary witnesses, you know. But I would imagine if they're contributing, they're certainly not going to, you know, badmouth them. But they will at least not not, uh, you know, they'll they'll look the other way, you know. But yeah. now now Carl he 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 had a kid from his previous marriage. Uh, that kid's no longer a kid right now, right? Is, is he an adult? Yeah, now? he has. Um, Carl has three adult um, daughters. Um, pro- okay. In the in the story, I believe the youngest one was um, was mentioned, but that she was an adult when uh, Carl and I um, got together. So yes, but he does have um, three daughters and uh, seven grandchildren. Oh wow! So does yeah. he? Does he does he have communication with them? Oh yes, oh yes. They're not um, witnesses. Oh so, wow! Even though they were raised as witnesses, um, I credit his girls with pretty much kind of figuring it out at a young age. They kind wow. of figured out that it was it was kind of um, um, BS. But um, they, um, yeah. So no, we we um, we we communicate with all of them. So so his ex and I and I got I get to she's gotta I get be kicked to off. <laughs> Everybody left. <laughs> well, you know, yeah. Well, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know how she, how she, um, how she feels about it, but I think that process had kind of started already. Yeah. Um, you know, oh no, no, I, I mean, there's no doubt the oldest problems. Yeah, because um, the older two had kind of already, um, you know, stopped, uh, stopped um, earlier than that. Maybe the youngest was still going, but. Um, you know, I'm I'm really happy for them. I'm happy that they're not still in that and, and trying to live that way because at least they're able to raise their children, right. you know, and send them to college and you know with with more normalcy than they were raised with. You yeah. know, and and Carl, That's in like fact, me. I'm, I'm I'm living vicariously through my children. Through the children, yeah. You and know, and I, Carl, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I said no, he, he kind of has a. Phone. He has a measure of guilt uh, for raising his daughters that way. You know, he wishes that 
he he would have raised them differently and that they could have had, you know, different opportunities. But um you know, it is what it is and you know, they're they're doing, you know, they're doing well. And um, you know, and again, the the grandchildren get to um live fuller lives, you know, than uh, than his children did as as young people. Right, right. Well, yeah, like I say, you've lived vicariously to your grandchildren in that case. Yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah. they get to enjoy the holidays and they don't have to be ostracized or look funny at in school when they don't stand up for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> right, know? right. All it's the great stuff that they that don't have to go through, through that. Oh, yeah, it's, it's it's great. And they just so they get all of that. So hard being kid and the witnesses. Oh, yeah. Oh. Uh, I shudder. <laughs> It's terrible. I, I remember, and and you know, you lose your opportunities. You, you know, college. You know, my kids. You know, I'm, they're gonna go to college. I, I'm, I'm very fortunate that you know, I'm, that we had kids late. But um, the, the reason why we had kids late was because I thought Armageddon was coming. So. Yeah. Well, at least you had them. I didn't have any at all. You know. By the time no, you, I figured it all out, I I don't yeah. have any. You know. So. That's good you had them. <laughs> well, you, you you get you have you have experience. Oh yeah, I, 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 his oh, kids yeah. And, yeah. And, his, and, oh, and yeah. his grandkids. Yeah. Yes, now you you, you you mentioned you had one brother. Did, was that the only brother that you had in the witnesses? No, there were four of us. Um, four. You know, I had the one brother that um, was at Bethel with me. Um, one of my my sister um, was in uh, went to Gilead. And um, then I, my other brother, he didn't go to Bethel or, or Gilead, but you know he he also, um, you know we we all you know try, we were tried to be good witnesses and all. So, um, but the, but that brother is um, um, is also disfellowshipped um, now. So I do have one sibling that is also um, disfellowshipped. He was disfellowshipped a couple of years before me. And so he doesn't. Live, we don't live in. Yeah, we do talk. He doesn't live in the same state. Um, uh-huh. As I do, but um, but yeah, we do talk and he, and we visit each other, and you know at least we're able to talk about you know our growing up. You know we share that and we know how it was growing up in our house and you know just the whole thing and 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 we pretty much share the same view of of the witnesses now. So that that's that's good that we have that um, camaraderie. But my other two siblings, um, we don't talk. And my sister had a son since I've been disfellowshipped, and I've only seen him a couple of times, you know, at funerals, and we really don't know each other. So, um, you know, I, mom, I hate you, that. Your yeah. mom and dad? Um, yeah, they uh, don't, um, yeah. They don't talk to you, right? No, they're they're still witnesses, and you know they um they uh, only when uh, there's a funeral or something do um do I see them. Yeah, right. there's there's been five funerals about five funerals in my family since we've since I've been disfellowshipped. So yeah. I've almost seen them like once a year, but it's always under um, bad circumstances, and it's always awkward. You know, it's just weird. You know, sometimes well, that's they're, they're friendlier. That, that took a lot of courage because I know my grandparents passed away. I, I didn't go. I didn't go to the funeral. And uh, my honestly, mom, Gus, I, I probably wouldn't have, but my brother yeah. always goes, you know, so it's kind of like he comes from out of town to go. Then it's kind of weird for me not to go. But uh, sorry sorry about your uh, your loss, too. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I, the thing is, I'm just – I'm. what people don't know about me is, you know, I'm a Christian, but I'm, there's still a lot of Gus in me, and I'm – very hot tempered and um and I'm just afraid that if I went and somebody disrespected me I'd just blow up. <laughs> I'd just, well, I'd just that's, blow up. that's a that's I'm afraid of that too. Uh, last <laughs> year my um my grandmother um died and and the the brother that gave the funeral talk was a brother that I used to love, you know. Mm-hmm. Um and I figured, well, you know, I said hopefully he'll have the decorum you know, not to say, you know, well, you know what your grandmother would have wanted or something like that from the platform because I was like, I'm not really sure how that would go. You know, that's, I'm not the same person that they knew, you know, and I'm I'm yeah. not going to just take that. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not too comfortable either. And now that this story has come out, 
you know, I don't know to what, you know, because before I was just kind of in the chat, you know, I mean, it, it's not like I went public and said, well, I'm Ryuka, right. here's what happened to me at Bethel, you know, so this was a huge step for me. And um, um, I'm happy because it seems that a lot of people have benefited from it. You know, we get emails and, mm-hmm. and good feedback from it. But at the same time, I'm, I'm generally, I have always been a pretty private person. Wow. And so now that this is out here, you know, I don't know if, if my family were to Google me, they would maybe see it. So they, they might, like, view me, like, as an apostate now. So, yeah. you know, I don't really know, like, if I would even be welcome at the funerals anymore. I don't know what right. impact this is going to have, you know, on it. So, you know, that remains to be seen. I you know, and I'm honestly I think I'm okay with it either way because I never was really comfortable being back in that arena. Anyway, it's all very surreal and um and and, and what, not what, very what's you, what's real. You... you know, it's not real. There's not real emotion, there's not real right. affection. It's all very bizarre, you know. And once you've been out for a while, you've developed a community and yes. of people that care about you. And yes. and that you know do have authentic interest in you as a person, not based upon what you believe or whatever, you know right. people that really care about you, and that's important. And uh, and that's you know for you know for me and Chill, that's been very important that we always have a community of people. And and I, I've been I've, I've really been blessed. You know I have you know we have of course we're all blessed because we have an online community. Yeah. people who understand what we're going through and um and then you know you have you know your your local friendships that you make you know amongst your your job and, or you yeah. know your, your just your, the people that you you interact with and it's yeah. important to, to to build those relationships because then it makes it easier um right. for us to transition because it's 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 in the beginning it's so hard for us all i mean look at what you went yeah. through yeah, um, I tell people we we licked our wounds for like the first two years. You know, it was just like, <laughs> okay, what just happened here? <laughs> and, 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 and it, it, it's going to take a lifetime for. I mean, the, the name of I, the the program. You know, Nate chose the name of the program was Healing XJWS. We've transitioned to you know just all cults and saying Healing X Outreach. That we're all all of us exes. Are healing, yeah. and it might take yeah. a whole life to heal from these things. It's just yes, yeah. so tough. Yeah, yeah. But overall, you know, I feel like with Carl and I, we're getting to this place where, you know, we're we're feeling like we're we don't we're not looking back as much. You know, we we right. know that we always will, and we're not we don't beat ourselves up for it. You know, because it's a part of where we come from and. You know that it's it's always going to be that way, but right. we we do it less now. We're we're so yes. like engrossed in our lives, like our lives are right. so interesting and our new friends are so interesting that we are getting like engrossed in that, and that's great. Yeah. You know, I I wouldn't have thought like five years ago or maybe even three years ago that we would be at this point now. So you know, I I, I try to tell everybody, you know, it it gets better. Um, you know, it's rough, you know, I'm not going to lie. And it, and, it, and there were always, there's always going to be issues related to our being exes, you know, well, but but it does get better. It definitely does. Yeah. Uh, you know, with my mom, you know, and people say, well, how come you don't, you know, I've really, in the beginning, I tried a lot to reach out to my mom, and I don't as much now because it's, 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 you know, you get to a point where you just have to move on and you can't think about those things. And when those things do come, you know, arise, you know you're gonna to have to deal with it, but it's just you will just rack your brain if you continue to deal with the same issues over and over again. And yeah. uh, it doesn't mean you stop loving those people. You just hope and pray that circumstances will have where they'll be more open and uh, be willing to to hear what you have to say. Um, we are coming to the last 12 minutes of our program, and I want to make sure that at least we get one listener who wants to say something, make a comment. Uh, share something with us. Press one. The number is three four seven nine three four zero three seven nine, and just press one if you want to share something with Maruka. You want to encourage her. Uh, something that you have a personal experience because uh, we're down to the last twelve minutes of the program. I extended it to two hours, um, and that's what happens. So you, <laughs> I told you that this wouldn't be hard for you. 
<laughs> I know. I was nervous. And the, the more yeah, we've it's gone just on, very it's conversational. Just, very conversational. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you know, uh, I don't see anybody pressing one. Okay. So I just, uh, I just want to thank you for sharing your story on this program. I, I do want to ask: um, uh, Are you one of the ghosts in Richard Kelly's uh, book? The uh, Ghosts from Mama's Club. Um, well, you know, I think in his story, and you know, I don't want to speak for him, but the ghosts are all these repercussions, you know, oh, okay. that uh, that you go through. But he is working on his third book, uh-huh. and um, and my story will be in his third book. Oh, okay. I am one yeah, of I'm, one of the stories. Yeah. Yeah, he's gonna come on in September, and he's gonna share about his uh, his uh, his new book, Ghosts from Mama's Club. Okay. And um, we're going to have Stephen Hassan in September, so that'll be great. And, good, uh, good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, once again, I just want to thank you for sharing your story, and um, and I know it's going to benefit a lot of people. Um, it's benefiting people that are listening now, and, and people that are going to listen to the podcast. And well, thanks um, for having me. Yeah, and uh, give you and Carl my love, and and um, I'm just going to keep you guys in our prayers. Um, oh, thank you very much. Yeah, so God bless you. Um, I just want to let our listeners know, um, Nate Beckman, who is you know has been off there for a while now. Uh, if you've been praying for him, he got a house. It's his first house, and so him and Sonia, you know, I was worried about him for a little while, but uh, they were renting a house, and the landlord wasn't paying the mortgage, even though they were paying the rent, and so. They were actually able to buy a house, and so um, I just congratulate congratulations to Nate and Sonia Beckman, and um, and um, we hope to hear from Nate soon. You know, um, he he'll probably come on sometime in September. This is some months are busy for him. Uh, next week, Eric Pat, Eric, Eric Piment, and we're going to talk about the Urantia book. And um, the following week, we have Pastor Brock Welgum. And Brock used to be a witness, and now he's a pastor. Um, and I think he's done a lot of online stuff with uh, Brian Vittora. So, um, and I think he's done some podcast stuff, but now he's pastoring. So we're going to hear his story. So um, without further ado, I uh, just want to thank you all for listening. And I'm just going to go ahead and end with a song that is appropriate with the topic that we had today. It's entitled... Pharisee. I've I've played it before. Let me look for it. And it's by uh, where is it? Pharisee. It's uh, oh, by the way, you can get these songs. uh, You can download them on cyiworldwide.com or worshiptogether.com for this music. There's all types of music there, so uh, free downloads. And uh, this is the song. I'm going to end it with that song. And and you all have, I'll see you 9 o'clock Eastern Time next week. And uh, you all have a great weekend. Bye-bye. <laughs>